Um, welcome everyone to the presidential address. Uh, I am Ron Witherup. I'm the vice president of the Catholic Biblical Association, and it's my privilege and honor to introduce the presidential address today. Um, I need to do the reminder about the protocols that we've all got to follow for this virtual meeting. Uh, remember that you are expected to identify yourselves by your real names, not using acronyms or symbolic names. Also remember that you uh, may not record uh, this presentation either by audio or video. Uh, also, you are encouraged to use the Zoom features to communicate, but inappropriate comments or behavior will lead to immediate removal from the conference by our tech people. And a videotape of this session will be posted to the CBA website by agreeing to appear in the Zoom window with audio and or visual contributions, you grant permission to the CBA to broadcast your likeness to social media outlets. So with those ground rules in place, uh, let me proceed to the introduction of this presidential address. Um, our president this year already has a distinction that likely none of her colleagues in the list of distinguished presidents of the CBA could possibly have. She has served two consecutive terms, thanks of course to the pandemic. In fact, she has multiple distinctions in her illustrious career that overshadow this most recent one, including her many awards as a teacher and author and her contributions to our association through committees, task forces, active participation in annual meetings and dedicated service on the executive board. Gina Hens-Piazza is the Joseph S. Alemany Professor of Biblical Studies at the Jesuit School of Theology of Santa Clara University in Berkeley, California. Her curriculum vitae is too extensive to be treated in detail here, so I will just highlight some diverse elements of it to give a broad picture of her multiple accomplishments. Gina's undergraduate studies at Canisius College were in religion and psychology, but she rather quickly oriented herself in the direction of biblical studies, especially Hebrew Bible. In 1976, she earned a master's degree in biblical studies at Vanderbilt University, and then followed that up with a master's in philosophy in 1990 at Union Theological Seminary in New York, where she also earned her doctorate in Hebrew Bible in 1992. Later in 2005, Gina earned a licentiate in sacred theology, the STL degree, which also allowed her to teach on an ecclesiastical faculty with, um, uh, which would feature prominently in her later career at the Jesuit School of Theology, where she was named a Professor Ordinarius in 2008. If this were not impressive enough, Gina earned a Physician's Assistance degree in uh, 2010 from the University of California Davis Medical School. And this in addition to her devotion to gardening and avidly following the Garden State, uh, Golden State Warriors, excuse me, not Garden State, but Golden State Warriors, provides Gina with lots of diversion. Now, Gina's multiple uh, publications encompass many bibliographical pages, but to my mind, three observations stand out. One is her extensive service as an editor. Over the years, she has served on editorial boards, such as the CBQ, the Journal for the Study of the Old Testament Supplement Series, and more recently, she edits the Heckema Journal and the New Oxford Commentary Series. She also engaged uh, major projects such as the forthcoming Jerome Biblical Commentary for the 21st Century, which Bloomsbury is gonna publish in November this year, uh, for which she co-edited with John Collins, the Old Testament contributions. A second significant area is to note the incredible breadth of Gina's interests seen in her books, essays, professional journal articles, book reviews, and speaking engagements. While Gina obviously concentrates on Hebrew Bible and related topics, she does not shy away from more controversial areas such as methodology and biblical studies and hermeneutics, violence in the Bible, issues in women's studies, ecology, justice and peace, and postmodern biblical interpretation. Having written uh, the commentary on Lamentations in the award-winning Wisdom Commentary Series, commentaries on First and Second Kings for the Abingdon Old Testament Commentaries, and a commentary on the book of Judith for the Paulus Biblical Commentary. Gina also has completed a commentary on the book of Ruth and a co-edited volume on the unity of the book of Isaiah 
both of which will appear in the near future. And finally, the third area I would highlight is Gina's interest in bridging the gap between biblical scholarship and the interests of ordinary people in the pews, something the CBA has been concerned about for some time. She has a passionate desire to see our commitment to professional biblical studies make a difference in the daily life of believers to the highest degree possible. And this is seen in her participation in many lecture series around the country and her willingness to publish in popular journals such as the Bible Today, U.S. Catholic, and Spirituality Today. Now, much more could be said about our president, but we are here, albeit virtually, not to hear about her, but to hear from her. So let's listen then together to Gina Hentz-Gasset's presidential address titled, Woman Zion's Destiny as Theological Disclosure, a Feminist Mapping of a Metaphor Across Isaiah. And I will come back at the end of the, uh, uh, at the, end of the talk uh, for a couple of other announcements. So I hope you'll stick around. But Gina, the floor is all yours. Thanks very much, uh, Ron, for that uh, immensely gracious uh, uh, introduction. And thanks to all for uh, attending at the end of uh, some people's day who have been in attendance on Zoom much of today. It's already been a great first day. And so I really appreciate your, your presence here. So let me begin. On the heels of uh, generations whose important studies have worked to uh, delineate and identify the host of traditions making up the text of Isaiah, overtures recently continue to search for what might qualify as the unity or unities binding together these 66 chapters. Of the many literary approaches in this investigation, themes are one of the most prominent overtures to this end. Themes such as family, justice, light, righteousness, sickness and healing, number among those noteworthy pursuits. Many projects with good reason have focused upon the centrality of Zion as dominant the dominant thread that binds together these various traditions across this lengthy prophetic scroll. After all, 154 times that Zion is cited in the Hebrew Bible, 47 of those iterations are found across the book of Isaiah. Ulrich Burgess, among others, have made a compelling case that Zion as a personage might be, in fact, a unifying key one that he notes is repeatedly occurring throughout this text and acquiring, as he calls it, prophetic traits and ultimately resembling the Ebed or the servant of God. In the opening chapters, Zion in fact is vulnerable to attack and scorn of the enemy, but still remains strong in trusting in Yahweh. In Isaiah 40 through 55, Burgess notes and argues that initially, Zion refuses to be comforted, but then gradually and only gradually accepts divine consultation, cons consolation. Finally, in his study, Burgess suggests that Zion begins to manifest traits of the servant and upon whom God's spirit is then bestowed. The final chapters of Isaiah is endow Zion with a prophetic persona in its mission especially to the poor in the post-exilic period in Burgess's study. Other courses for mapping the unity across Isaiah have attended to other components to make the case. As early as the 1950s, L.J. Liebrecht noted terms in parallels between the first and final chapters of Isaiah. In the follow-up essay, he noted more correspondences between the pronouncements in chapter one and their fulfillment in chapters 65 and 66. Several years later, Robert Lack continued mapping further thematic similarities, reinforcing the view that related bookends surround this text. Many others, and I won't mention all of them, but Berker, uh, excuse me, Becker and Buchan and Steck and Conrad and others have continued this work in seeking to demonstrate relationships and developments 
that tie together these opening closing chapters. This study that I'm presenting today builds upon that work, first of those who have focused on the centrality of Isaiah, uh, centrality of Zion in Isaiah, and second, upon those who have perceived connections between its opening and closing chapters. However, here my exegetical camera narrows further in that I take up the specific metaphoric representation of Zion as female in chapters one and chapter 66. Here I argue that the transformation of the metaphoric depiction of Zion from the book's beginning to its conclusion may serve as one potential unifying key for a more holistic reading of this text. Further, this study concludes with two observations, how its final personification of Zion as woman in chapter 66 contributes to the literary integrity for the concluding vision of eschatology and how this concluding celebrated personification of Zion as woman actually qualifies as a cultural exponent of the kind of realm in which such an eschatology can be realized. Without a doubt, Zion's destiny in the book of Isaiah is one of the most pervasive themes in these 66 chapters. What happens to Zion and Zion's own role in this outcome designates it as a major preoccupation of the book that's been established. And the entities to exactly what Zion refers are vast. Could be a fortified city, a hilltop, a collective entity, an actual people, a walled urban settlement, a holy place, a mountain. Thus the depictions of this thematic construct manifest in multiple metaphoric manifestations. And most frequently, these various depictions of Zion are portrayed specifically as a female entity. In these instances that I'm taking up, Zion is a female person endowed with human characteristics. Across these 66 chapters, she is at times a virgin daughter, a barren woman, a prostitute, a woman in labor, a spouse, a divorced wife, a grieving mother, all before we arrive at chapter 66. Such personifications disqualify, excuse me, as a subcategory of metaphor that draw upon and impact its own context, as well as continues to affect readers in future contexts. So first a word about metaphor as it's functioning in this study. Metaphor as is both its power and its function. Regarding its own context, the personification of Zion as woman selects, emphasizes, suppresses, and organizes features of the principal subject, in this case, Zion, by implying statements that normally apply to the subsidiary subject, woman, and in the process create new meaning. Yet the functioning capacity of the metaphorical statement depends not solely upon the understanding of woman per se, but upon the specific role, status, or identity assign the metaphoric woman, be that virgin or daughter or wife or divorcee or woman. The complexity of references signified thus depend first upon the personification of Zion as woman, and second, the specification of the woman's identity or societal role. Thus to understand the female personification here and its functioning power in the text, the role and status of women in general, and then women defined in a particular capacity in its own context must be elaborated. But how metaphors affect meaning in text is not solely dependent upon their function in ancient context. Recognition, excuse me, reception of metaphors also play a role. Regarding the import of the female personification of Zion on readers in future contexts, not only the function, but also the power of metaphor must be taken into account. Metaphors have power. They have power to structure our understanding of life. According to Lakoff and Turner, once formed and learned, quoting them, metaphors are just there, conventionalized, a ready and powerful conceptual tool 
automatic, effortless, and largely unconscious, end of quote. On the one hand, metaphors give us power to conceptualize and reason, but they also have power over us. Anything that we rely on consciously or unconsciously and automatically in as much as a part of, is a part of us that it cannot be easily resisted. So Lakoff and Turner conclude, quote, because metaphor can be used so automatically and effortlessly, we find it hard to question them, if we can even notice them. Hence, let, metaphors have the power to define what is real and even to signify what could be reality, end of quote. And that will be important when we get to eschatology. So let's look at woman Zion metaphors in chapter one and chapter 66. The opening chapter of Isaiah, which begins with the accusation speech of Yahweh in verses two through four, and concludes with divine assurance of redemption in Zion, of Zion in 27 through 31, is widely recognized as the introduction to this book as a whole. This summary framework also offers our first encounter with Zion personified as female. A woe oracle with a lament in verses four through nine portrays daughter Zion at risk before an enemy. I'll read verse eight here in my translation. Daughter Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a field of melons, end of quote. Many translated versions render Bat Zion as daughter of Zion, which would seem to refer to a female inhabitant of the city. However, I'm translating here with an understanding that the syntactic, that syntactically the Hebrew construct chain is an appositional and or explicative genitive. Thus, daughter Zion serves as characteristic personifying Zion and therefore invites the translation, not daughter of Zion, but daughter Zion. This initial personification of Zion as daughter in the opening chapters of Isaiah summons the examination of the metaphor most dominant in the early chapters of this book. Zion is referred to as daughter Zion six times in one through 39. The use of bot with a geographical name frequently served as a title for goddesses in the ancient Near East. Though likely influenced by these ancient Near Eastern epithets, daughter Zion is never understood as a goddess in the Hebrew Bible. Thus, an understanding of the reference daughter Zion must proceed from its status as metaphor. First, the, so the sociological understanding or the societal understanding that enshrines the cultural category of daughter in the ancient Near East and in ancient Israel summons attention and investigation. This has been well established. A daughter in the ancient Israelite context receives definition an identification in conjunction with the Beit Av, of which she is a member. The Beit Av, or house of the father, was the societal unit to which a daughter belonged. She was identified with and dependent upon the father for her social and economic well-being. The father was a source of protection of the daughter and her security, especially before any threats to her security, in particular, sexual violence. At the same time, the waywardness of the daughter or the violation of the daughter's chastity would lead to the father's dishonor. Only when a daughter came under the domain of a husband was she released from the authority of her father. Thus, the identity of daughter signified female, lacking jurisdiction means lacking jurisdiction over herself. She was dependent upon and subjugated to the decisions and enforcements of her father. When introduced in the first chapter of Isaiah, verse eight, daughter Zion is further described as a booth in a vineyard, a hut in a melon patch. Here, the personification of Zion as daughter is thickened by a further metaphor, which likens the daughter to a hut or a shelter in an agricultural field. In my mind, it's a kind of veritable metaphor within a metaphor. This hut or booth, a structure serving day laborers, is only temporary, not stable. It is easily assaulted by severe weather or trampled by those seeking to make trouble for the landowner. Certainly the opposite of a walled and protected household or fortress 
its structure stands precarious. Thus the comparison of daughter Zion to this shanty of a shelter magnifies the daughter's vulnerability, her unprotected position and the ease with which she could be plundered or overcome. The violence that this is threatening is eas could easily topple a hut. Here personified daughter Zion receives even further specification by implication in the preceding verse where twice the condition of desolation is narrated. Verse seven pronounces that I quote, your house lies desolate and your land, it is desolate. Here the Hebrew, uh, samema, which denotes both desolation and barrenness is used elsewhere in the biblical tradition to describe not only ravaged environmental conditions, but also the ravaged state of a violated woman. Having been raped by her half brother, Amnon, the tradition reports that Tamar remained Shamema, desolate, a desolate woman in her brother Absalom's house, 2 Samuel 13 and 20. Hence the state of the country and land as desolate informs the metaphoric depiction of the potentially vulnerable daughter, Zion, alone in a field like a hut. She is not only vulnerable to plunder, but specifically and potentially uh, to be plundered sexually by violence. This predicated violence actualizes just a few verses later, but in a way that holds her responsible. In Isaiah 121, daughter Zion is now designated as a prostitute. The Hebrew root of the participle form appearing here links zona with both prostitution and fornication. But attention to the social culture and literary circumstances in each instance informs the complexity of what is meant. Prostitution shares with fornication a fundamentally female role or profile. Yet the fact remains that both activities require male participation and typically male initiation as in Genesis 38. Thus the female prostitute, though an anomaly, is a tolerated specialist who evidently accommodates the conflicting desires of those who exercise exclusive control perhaps over their wives' sexuality while at the same time having access to other women. Adding to this iniquity, Deuteronomy 22:23 mandates that in instances where the woman participant is engaged to be married, only she is punished. Such asymmetry characteristic of such societies reflects the unevenness and inequities of gender roles, values, obligations, and regulations. In chapter one then, as introduction to the whole of Isaiah, Zion's identity shifts from vulnerable daughter in verse eight to now a prostitute in verse 21. And what exactly this eclipse in personification means is clarified in the immediately following verses. Once righteous and just, she is now populated by murderers. The cause of her abrupt transformation from daughter to prostitute is defined by corrupt leadership that defiled her. Those who love bribes and pursue gifts are the ones ignoring the cause of the orphan and the widow are all earmarked here as responsible. Here, this analysis does not fix upon so much the issue of gender as having to do with sexed bodies. Instead, it attends to the broader discourse latent here, focusing upon issues of power as it organizes and hierarchicalizes social identity, relationships, and the consequences therein. Forwarding a metaphoric portrait of woman as prostitute to obscure in charge powerful individuals and their lack of responsibility is itself an exercise of power and very familiar in the biblical traditions. As early as Genesis 3.12, the biblical creation account, as we well know, witnesses how the first man tries to obfuscate his culpability by blaming the woman when God is looking for them in the garden. And the inequities that result are not the product of creation in the garden, but rather the consequences of the fall. The inequities between gender echo in the woman 
will long for her husband, but he will lord it over her, are one of the many outcomes foisted upon humanity for disobedience, disrupting the created order, and they appear to be too often present in these biblical stories. And again and again, the biblical traditions relate not only accounts of societal inequities that subjugate women, but also forward accounts of even metaphoric women who become the front, obscuring the religious and political leadership that prophets speak against um, in accounts of metaphoric women who obscure, excuse me, obscuring the religious and political leadership responsible for Israel's waywardness, as we hear in the prophets. One need only call to mind Jeremiah 2 through 4, or Lamentations 1 through 2, or the metaphors in Ezekiel 16 and 23 as illustrative. Perhaps Jacob Stromberg gets it right when he notes, quote, that given the verses 21b through 26 in this first chapter of Isaiah, which place faults squarely on the leadership, while at the same time saying nothing about Zion's own choice in the matter. The metaphor describing her transformation into a prostitute paints her more as a victim than a perpetrator of these crimes, end of quote. Thus the transformation of Zion's identity from threatened daughter to prostitute may well communicate moral defection and the abuse of power, but not of the metaphoric woman Zion but rather of those hiding behind her. Five times Daughter Zion appears in these first 39 chapters, along with other foreign cities identified as vulnerable or endangered daughter. This persistent metaphor characterization further testifies to the often vulnerable and precarious status associated with this social category of daughter. In response, Daughter Devon, initiates a response, a lament in response to the condemnation of Moab in 15.2. And in 23.10, an oracle addressing Tyre informs daughter Tarshish that her ports have been taken away, so her ships have no place to land. In the same chapter, Zion, Zidon, excuse me, also addressed as daughter is described as a raped virgin who will not recover. And then a final time in these opening 39 chapters, Zion is summoned as daughter. She is now referred to as virgin daughter Zion in 37.22. Here the text portrays her as an instrument of insult to enemies. She is described as, quote, despising and scorning the enemy, tossing her head behind his back. A clear reference to probably King Shanacharib of Assyria. One might question, however, why in this instance, daughter Zion now has become further designated as virgin daughter Zion. Preying upon women was a well-known war tactic in the ancient Near East, directed against men with, excuse me, against, directed against women with whom, of course, men were being uh, affiliated particularly daughters of these men. Their sexual violation in wartime was a brazen act by men demonstrating their military superiority and power. The reference to daughter Zion that highlights her virgin status attests to the terrors and trauma of rape to which she would have been subject had the Assyrian army been triumphant. In this instance, virgin daughter of Zion functions as a wartime trophy in her virgin status, signifying Judah's resistance before the military encampment. Hence, the overarching portrait of daughter Zion in Proto-Isaiah encompasses vulnerability, abandonment, affliction, blame, and finally, as an emblem or trophy of national resistance despite enemy threat. In the interest of time, I'm just going to summarize the subsequent chapters of Isaiah. The subsequent chapters of Isaiah all but abandon the title Daughter Zion with but one instance in 40 through 55, where she's told to loosen the chains around her neck. That's in 52.2. And only one citation of being a daughter in 56.66, where she hears that perhaps her children will be returned to her. 
Instead, for the span of chapters 40 through 65, female Zion's metaphor morphs now into an adult woman. And across these chapters, woman Zion herself is often heard describing her current state. As a mother, she sees herself childless and barren. She has been subject to the terror of witnessing her children slain in warfare in 51. As a woman, she describes herself abandoned and forgotten. While she's depicted as a bride, she is also a wife and later claiming to be rejected and even served a bill of divorce by her spouse. Moreover, she is also presented as widowed without anyone to care for her in 54.4. So how does Zion's personification in the final chapter of Isaiah fare? And how might it lend literary integrity and closure to these 66 chapters, a challenge and reverse inequities and injustice represented in the variegated, often lamentable personification of Zion as a metaphoric woman across this prophetic text. Scholars have observed that the contours of what is meant by the vision of the new heaven and the new earth of Isaiah's eschatology in chapter 65 manifest as the restoration of the condition of the garden at creation. In 65, 17, 24, for example, images abound of the land being fertile again and productive, people not laboring in vain, but enjoying the work of their hands. Women bearing children and enmity among animals is being resolved. As the harmony of creation is being restored, one witnesses here the reversal of the consequences of the fall. In chapter 66, the reversal prompted by this new creation manifests specifically in the transformed metaphor personifying Zion. In the opening of the chapter, she was the endangered, in the opening chapter, she was the endangered daughter who like a hut in an agricultural field remained vulnerable, unprotected and ultimately assigned identity as a prostitute who appeared more victimized and blamed than actually guilty. But in chapter 66, she is not only portrayed as restored, but becomes the one revelatory manifestation of this new creation. In chapter 66 consists of a collection of passages, some say three, some say up to seven pericopes, introduced by prophetic rubrics. Among these, verses seven through nine fix on woman Zion. Here she is no longer a daughter or a virgin or a woman in labor, etc. Instead, the metaphoric depiction of female Zion is unprecedented and its presentation is surrounded by two images of theophany. First in verse six that precedes her description, we hear the announcement of the noise and uproar of the coming of the Lord. And then following her description, and we hear again, the Lord speaks in verse 10 after she is described and is identifies divine activity as participating in that that describes woman Zion. The characterization of Zion and her activity that unfolds within this divine inclusio is extraordinary. I read here verse seven. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before pain even came upon her, she delivered. She is now a fertile woman who gives birth, but in keeping with the notion of the new heavens and new earth, visioned in these concluding chapters, woman Zion gives birth in a manner that eclipses normal birthing processes. She bears offspring without pain or even with extended labor. And since she gives birth, even before labor begins, the process proceeds quickly. Again, in verse eight, we hear, who has heard of such a thing? shall a whole nation be delivered in a moment. Yet Zion was, as she began her labor, giving birth to children, plural. Zion gives birth to new children in this new creation theme. Immediately following, God oversees the birth as if a midwife. With rhetorical questions, God identifies the divine's own restorative role as associated with birthing. Do I bring to the moment of birth and not give delivery, says the Lord? Do I close up the womb when I bring delivery, says the Lord? Returning to the metaphor of woman Zion, the Lord elaborates further Zion's personification. Here the audience receives divine assurance 
that woman Zion will nurse them with comforting breast. Those who drink will do so deeply until they are satisfied. Further, the Lord promises that they will drink deeply with delight from her breast. Hence, they will be nourished by her overflowing abundance. And not only will they be nurtured, but woman Zion, continuing the personification here as glorified mother, God also promises how those restored will be cared for. They will be carried on her hips and dandled on her knees. The vividness of the personification presented by the divine description of woman Zion. Here, a fertile body, laborless process of birthing, the birthing of multiple children, her breast, her hips, her knees. All of these descriptions are significant. The sexualized denigration of woman's body so often portraying the iniquity of the people and even personifying Zion as prostitute in the opening of this book has been overturned and now celebrates woman's body as a locus of life and the delight of those born. Even before striking, excuse me, even more striking is the interrelationship between Zion's elaborated womanhood as mother and God's subsequent recitation. Immediately following the very physical personification of Mother Zion, the Lord pronounces that the divine's own participation in the restoration will be like that of a mother. Following the description of woman Zion, we hear God's voice, as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. Here, the juxtaposition of the description of woman Zion as mother with the divine's identification with mothering grasps the fertile, birthing, nurturing mother image of Zion on the very claims of who God will be for this people. But woman Zion functions not only as the image of how restoration will be experienced and as a template of how God's care will be fashioned. Her description also corroborates the establishment of the new heaven and the new earth. With both subtle and more literal illusion, her portrait suggests the establishment of a new creation that emancipates humanity from the consequences of the fall. Here, the eschatological image of salvation within this final chapter as pinnacle and conclusion of this book enlists the elements that reestablishing the paradisical situation of Eden identified with the new creation of new heaven and new earth. First, the explicit yet uncensored description of her body often used to signal shame and blame by the prophets, here is set forth to signal new life and comes into focus without need to obscure or to excuse. Hence the nakedness of the Garden of Eden that signaled the experience of guilt from disobedience of the first parents is reversed by this honored and elevated description of woman Zion. Second, the consequence of the fall mandated that woman would give birth with labor and pain that woman Zion brings forth new children painlessly, signals a new creation where consequences have been wiped away. Third, unlike the consequences of the fall, no longer will her husband, a symbol of those who subjugated woman, women in this hierarchical framework of that context, lord it over her. In this new creation, the woman mother personification of Zion coincides with how God will be with the community. This identification with an alliance between woman Zion and the divine challenges and nullifies the legitimacy of social stratifications that rendered women defined and controlled and unequal. Yet the elevated portrait of a birthing breastfeeding mother as metaphor for Zion still warrants qualification, especially as a feminist interpretation. For ultimately the celebrated portrait of Zion as mother still plays into the prevailing cultural mindset, defining women too narrowly with regard to mere biology and sexual function. That Zion as city is often metaphorized as personified female, has little to do with the grammatical gender, ha'ir, of the Hebrew. Rather, cities like women are hierarch in hierarchical societies were managed, controlled, and useful in providing food and a habitable place for life. Hence, cities were useful and could provide functions, not unlike the view of women as mothers. So the identification of God with Zion's motherhood as one with procreative power in chapter 66 
seems to challenge and redefine the status of woman as mother in this particular context. Though functioning in her capacity to give birth, there is no reference here to her status as wife. Instead, she is identified with God in the capacity of co-creator, bringing about a new heaven and a new earth. Further, this alliance between God and the personification of woman Zion once again reaches back to the creation account when God recognized that it was not good for the Adam to be alone. So God determined to provide, in Hebrew, an etzir. And of course, etzir is often translated as helper, which, of course, has tended to be misleading at times, suggesting a subordinate or perhaps even an inferior. While the Hebrew word etzir carries actually no such connotations, to the contrary, across biblical texts, and particularly in the Psalms, etzir is characteristically used to describe God, the creator and savior of Israel. Hence, in the Genesis creation story, the anticipated creation of woman anticipates one like unto God, not unlike the alliance drawn here between woman Zion's figure as mother and God own identification with this metaphor. Now, some may object that immediately following in verses 14 through 16 and concluding this section, we have a verse, three verses that seem to undercut the metaphoric identification of God with woman Zion. Instead, the more typical metaphor of God as militant warrior deity, as the one who rescues people and destroys the enemy with fire, presides as a final note. Yet the preceding just juxtaposition of God's identification with Mother Zion's metaphor, immediately followed by the one more familiar divine warrior deity, I think helps to recode the sovereignty of God. In addition to this metaphor, in addition, this metaphor offers an essential addendum to a one-dimensional theology. A deity conceived solely as a force who comes in fire executing judgment with indignation against enemies is inadequate and cannot depict the divine in its fullness. Elevated to kinship with God and even functioning as the metaphor of how God will be with humanity, this extraordinary portrait of woman Zion challenges the singularity of this model offered by the previously dominant theology while potentially qualifying as one possible theological linchpin for the yet to be realized Isaiah eschatology. In the new heaven and the new earth envisioned in this final chapter, the portrait of God eclipses such simplification. Instead, the woman Zion metaphor alongside the warrior metaphor thickens and offers a more complex theology. The profundity of the Holy One here manifests not solely as one or the other, but manifest as a warrior power that overpowers, but also as a maternal power that brings to life, nurture, and ultimately empowers people. While many have noted the parallels between the opening and closing chapters of Isaiah as grounds for arguing the literary unity of this text, also worthy of attention are the shifts from beginning to end. And as I've noted here, the very clear differences from beginning to end that speak of fulfillment of what is visioned and what is actualized. In chapter one, personified Zion received description as a daughter, vulnerable, assailable, and even blamed and victimized. In the intervening chapters, the metaphors portrayed Zion as mother, wife, divorcee, bereaved, and abandoned. But in this final chapter, she represents not only the disclosure of a new creation, but also as the epitome of the once broken relationships now restored. Metaphors are not mere literary devices for transporting meaning. They also serve to craft and define reality. And in this case, the new eschatological reality. Here, the metaphoric woman represents more than Zion. She makes sense only if she also functions as the cultural exponent. The cultural exponent that summons new identity an elevated value for women in this yet to be realized eschatology. Here in this final chapter, the personified female is no longer threatened but celebrated and surrounded by the divine. She is no longer vulnerable, victimized or blamed, 
but the source of livelihood for humanity. Finally, she is no longer the representative of a controlled or subjugated class, but instead she is allied with God. Such reversals disclose the radicality of an eschatology that perhaps eclipsed even, eclipsed even this prophet's own grasp, the grasp of what would be required for the eventual actualization of what Isaiah visioned as the new heavens and the new earth. Thank you very much. Well, Gina, thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of all of the participants, I wanna thank you for a, a very interesting and fascinating uh, conference that you've given us and uh, tracing this important uh, feminine metaphor and the transformation that it shows. Uh, I like myself in particular the connection with uh, the theme of new creation, which of course, as you know, uh, goes, uh, goes into the New Testament uh, as well. For instance, <laughs> in somebody like Paul, who's a, of interest to me uh, in particular, but I really appreciate this reading of Isaiah that you've given us and, uh, and showing the possible unity of the book as well. Uh, I think it's a, it's a wonderful metaphor that you've explored for us. So on behalf of everybody, thank you. Sure. And uh, I think we can, you can't hear the applause, unfortunately, <laughs> probably most of us, but we're applauding. <laughs>